presentation based on uh, partial results um, from a report that uh, actually is the base for our conference. And this report was uh, issued by the Institute of Economic Society and Peace in the Middle East, WGC. Um, you, some of you can get the hard, hard copy of the report uh, here in the entrance. Um, it's, a, it's a summary of the globalization uh, chapter at uh, the report. Uh, we all uh, attribute the uh, great importance to the impact of, of uh, population values. Actually, yesterday it was largely discussed um, in, on a manner of discrimination and um, other ways. And uh, it's very important to get familiar with popular uh, population values in a manner of uh, willingness to give up uh, historical or maybe outdated perceptions in, in a favor of progress and the maturity for peace. Uh, we know that in general, peace agreements are issues uh, top down. When leaders are signing an agreement and then both countries' population get up one morning for a peace agreement. But, but peace could be something like that we can describe a, a, a bottom up process. And the globalization process, and uh, as we elaborate in this report, can be a, a huge background to enhance and to push forward to a, a peace or cooperation between uh, countries. Uh, when when a country is more open, we can say that is more exposed to other uh, countries' uh, culture, to different uh, social um, economies, uh, to different uh, government practices and uh, so forth. And even they can uh, learn or view other types of democracy and uh, freedom. So uh, what we did in this uh, report, uh, actually we generate a, a composite uh, index of uh, globalization and openness. Um, the, the database was the um, World Bank uh, 2019 in, in general. Um, we looked over 15 uh, indicators, as you can see uh, them right now, availability of electricity, percentage of uh, imports, computers and communication components of total imports, imports of goods and services as percentage of GDP, uh, <clears throat> sorry, duration of compulsory education, ease of opening new businesses, percentage of renewable energy production, number of landlines, number of mobile phone subscribers per 100 person, uh, rate of tourists per capita, number of tourists, income of tourists as a percentage of exports, population in big city, population in big cities of 1 million people, percentage of internet users and patent registrations. Uh, all these uh, indicators were uh, ranked uh, according to, to the distance from the, the median. And uh, we generalize the equal weight um, composite index. To show you some uh, of our findings, uh, the stylus facts, uh, we can see, for example, that for a business environment, um, ease of starting new businesses, the UAE stands uh, actually on the first place after is uh, Turkey, third place is in Israel, Morocco is on the fourth place. And in the South, we can find Yemen, Libya, and uh, Syria. Uh, numbers of uh, days to start a business the United Arab Emirates are on the first place, Greece second, Oman is the third, Israel basically somewhere here in the middle. Uh, even Morocco should, is a bit easier or you need less days to open a new business, maybe less bureaucratic process. Uh, research. <clears throat> uh, we, can, we, we found that uh, Iran uh, stands on the first place with the number of patent uh, registered um, for a year. Turkey is on the second place and Israel is only 
Uh, in the third, maybe some of the Israeli um, industries prefer to register the patent abroad, or, or maybe there's a um, other thing, but Israel is on top tier, but not the first one, as one may be expected. Uh, on the other uh, end, we find Cyprus, the last one, Jordan, and United Arab Emirates uh, also. Um, communication. Uh, we, we can see that, uh, for example, uh, Cyprus is on the second place where, where we uh, looking on number of cellular subscribers and the number of lane line. Uh, United Arab Emirates are in the first place here and Greece uh, on the right uh, side. Um, Israel is located uh, somewhere in after one third and uh, in landlines, Israel is number three. So Bezek is still a strong company here in Israel, one can say. Uh, on the other side, we can find Sudan, Jordan and Yemen taking the uh, last places, um, which is changed between them. So there's a lack of communication in these three countries mobile and landlines, uh, travel and tourists. Um, of course, there are some countries that are um, well known with, the, with their tourist industry, but uh, it's other thing if it's huge income for the country. So um, the, the left chart uh, displayed the tourism revenue as a percentage of total exports of the country. And Jordan is uh, in the first place, 41%. Uh, second was uh, Syria, but it was mainly uh, prior to its last 10 years prior to 2018. So it's some of it was the civil war, but not all of it. Of course, today things are different. And also Greece uh, had a huge tourism, tourism revenue uh, per GDP. The, the other side is uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and uh, Libya. Um, when we speak about globalization and influence of tourists, one important indicator could be number of tourists relative to population size. And we see that there's a lot of tourism relative to local population in Cyprus, in Greece, and even in the Arab Emirates. Uh, on the other side, of course, Iraq, Sudan, and Yemen have a low incoming tourists relative to the population. And the uh, last indicator, as I told you, you can see the all indicators on the report was the imports of goods and services as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and we can find this Cyprus in the first place, uh, United Arab Emirates in second, and the West Bank and Gaza on third, sorry. Um, Israel is uh, located uh, in the fourth place from, from the bottom, and Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Sudan basically have a low percentage of imports and goods and services relative to GDP. You can say there are more closed economies. Um, okay, so that's actually the, the main result, the, the composite index. Uh, but the composite index also display some interesting and maybe not that common or uh, what we would think should be. Uh, the first place is uh, actually conquered by Turkey, uh, the second Greece, the third Cyprus, uh, the fourth Iran, one place before uh, Israel, and even with some distance based on the uh, index uh, that we generate. Um, so, but we can say that the most open and globalized countries are uh, the, the, the countries that I mentioned. And uh, on the other side, we can say that the, clo the closed countries are Sudan, Yemen, Iraq, Libya, and in some way, even Jordan. Um, so we know that uh, it's, or we think it's very important to um, identify the level of openness and the willingness to globalize uh, within the country. 
um, improving uh, a relationship with the open and global country may contribute positively to any economy, especially when talking about uh, Israel um, and uh, with enhancing the bilateral relationship between two countries, uh, even a, a peace can emerge. And if there all already a peace, it can be flourish. Uh, more than that, I uh, would like to say that uh, this research was only the first step in a long way. Further research uh, may also be needed to examine causal relationship uh, of the examined variables and others in the context of willingness for peace between countries of the region. Um, thank you very much. That was the presentation. If there are any questions you'd like to ask, yes. That's right. I need a microphone. Thank you very much for three excellent presentations. I'll actually concentrate on the last one, but I think that the other two might also uh, have relevance for my question. On your slides, number three and four, you spoke about uh, communication and trade. So my question is, have you differentiated there between uh, individual personal communication versus uh, company communication? For example, UAE has 200 lines for 100 people. So I could assume one personal, one company. And have you differentiated between the private sector and the public sector uh, as well in terms of investment. We know for a fact now that the Ministry of Communication and the U.S. handle is invested in a fiber optic network, which is going to jump Israel's communication from being number 37 in the region to number 12. And that's just because of a lack of public investment compared to private investment. So these are the questions regarding yes. uh, that. But obviously the two presentations previously would yeah. also be involved because if you have a platform for education, would that platform for education also necessitate a government infrastructure of telecommunications so your citizens can utilize it or are you relying on the private sector? So for other presenters, the same type of question. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for your question. Uh, you, you correct 100% uh, with your uh, remarks. Uh, communication, uh, first of all, no, we didn't go that far. It's, it's a data issue and it's very interesting to, to uh, Check the data from industry perspective and the population perspective. But uh, we also know that communication is changed over, over time. For example, we can communicate via WhatsApp, so we don't need a, a regular uh, uh, and via computer, for example. So we don't need a mobile and we don't need a landline. So there are many ways of communicating, for, for example, the Zoom. So things are changing. And uh, we need to take it into account. That's the reason that's the first research and we still have a long way to go. And uh, maybe Professor Ben David will have to can add something to contribute. Hey, I would uh, add uh, to what uh, Ron says. Uh, when we built the index, uh, there were some limitations. One of them was that uh, we, are, we were discussing with data. We, we had to use data which were available. Most of the data we used were coming from the World Bank. And uh, uh, maybe we wished to have uh, much more data to use, but uh, the situation is that uh, we couldn't. We, we, did, we did our best. We used the uh, hundreds of indicators for various uh, uh, indices. And in this case, for globalization, there are other uh, limitations. For example, when you say that Iran and uh, Turkey have much more patent registrations than Israel, uh, it's not enough to measure the quantity. You also wish to uh, take in consideration the quality. And there's no way to do it because uh, when you use numbers, you know, you cannot generally it's hard to do such work. So uh, this score grading of the countries is uh, limited. It's a first work as Ron says, but uh, it gives a platform. It gives a, a way and a model for grading the countries. Another thing is when you grade, uh, when you take many indicators in order to build a major index, you ask yourself, what, what is the weight you should give to each 
uh, indicator, and this is uh, not a simple question. Uh, in this case, I think we used an equal weight. So it's not easy, and uh, we can argue, and you can argue about it, but this is the uh, this is the place and time to do it and argue, and maybe this conference will give a first opportunity to deal with uh, such issues. Thank you. Uh, any more questions from the audience or uh, Zoom participants to, to the other speakers also, to uh, Dr. Kadili or to Dr. Idan? No questions? Okay, so thank you very so, much. Uh, I would like to ask uh, if we have more yeah. time. Uh, uh, to Asher Idan, I would like to ask about uh, Bitcoin because I, 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 I saw his perspective regarding that and regarding the question of uh, Professor Samoka of uh, capitalism, where we're going with that. Regarding the, the Bitcoin, uh, you know, if uh, all countries, all governments in the world would say, would say Bitcoin will not be used in our territory. I suppose that the value of the Bitcoin will go down drastically as it happened the last, I think last month when China says that they forbid the use of Bitcoin. So it's, you are very, I would say sure about yourself of where, the, where we are going in the future regarding uh, using Bitcoin. But uh, the question is uh, what governments will do when they see that they cannot issue uh, currencies anymore by themselves. Uh, and the answer is that no country, not China, not United States, can stop the Bitcoin because we are still thinking in old concept of 19th century of nation states. But we are already from McLuhan in 1964, we are in a global village that there are uh, 150 million users of the Bitcoin. Now, two points will happen. If China will stop, will ban Bitcoin, United States or the Arab nations can take the Bitcoin and they will make to the people who ban the Bitcoin what the Industrial Revolution did to the old powers of the Ottoman Empire in China. The Ottoman Empire in China lose their power in the uh, 20th century, in the 19th century, because they didn't want to use the steam engine. The steam engine is 100 times more powerful economy and in everything than hand power. So the Bitcoin and the network generally, network create already Apple with two and a half trillion dollar and Microsoft with two trillion dollar and Facebook with one trillion. They are bigger than country. The internet is bigger than any nation state, United States or England or Israel. That's why, first of all, they're afraid, it's game theory. They're afraid, they, 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 uh, they're afraid to ban the Bitcoin, because if one power will ban it, the other will leverage it, and the, the one who ban it will lose the competition on the global, uh, being a global uh, main power. So this is, first of all, uh, the dilemma, the game theory dilemma between Russia, China, United States, Europe. They know that the Bitcoin is a big power. Second, they can't ban it because there are 150 million that use it in their hands. What, what United States or China can do to stop one person in Brazil or in Morocco from using the Bitcoin? There is no possibility to stop it. They can't, they can't do it anymore. They could do it maybe in 10 years ago when the Bitcoin was two years old but it's decentralized. It's, 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 it's impossible to stop it. The problem with Bitcoin is that it is a power consumer that uh, harm the environment. And uh, now nations are more aware of the harmness of such a, a computerizing, decentralized uh, Bitcoin and other currencies. And we can see that uh, there's a shift to more or to less 
uh, power consumption, uh, cryptocurrencies like uh, Dogecoin that uh, Elon Musk likes very much. That's the future. Less con yeah. less consumption sure. of power and energy. Sure, the Bitcoin are moving to green energy. Most of the Bitcoin uh, is mined by uh, 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 green energy. 70% of the uh, energy of Bitcoin come from green energy. But we have to think how you mine uh, dollar. You mine dollar with 10 uh, aircraft, with 10,000 American base all over the world. How much uh, uh, dirty energy take uh, the dollar to create and uh, to, to, to hold? It's uh, more than 20 times dirty energy than the Bitcoin, the dollar. And if you take the euro, it's more than six times the Bitcoin. So the question is not how much energy the Bitcoin take, but the question is how much uh, relative in, rel in, in relative in, com in comparison to the Bitcoin or the old money uh, energy at stake. This is the question. Most of the people focus on the Bitcoin energy, but they ignore the dollar energy, the euro energy, the shekel energy. This is a point. Important thing to consider. Any more questions? So thank you very much.